Hi everyone, we're continuing in our series in Jeremiah and uh, today we're looking at Jeremiah chapter 13. So if you've got a Bible, I'd love you to follow along with me. I'm reading the whole of Jeremiah chapter 13. Thus says the Lord to me, Go and buy a linen loincloth and put it around your waist and do not dip it in water. So I bought a loincloth according to the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time. Take the loincloth that you have bought, which is around your waist, and arise, go to the Euphrates, and hide it there in a cleft of the rock. So I went and hid it by the Euphrates, as the Lord commanded me. And after many days the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates, and take from there the loincloth that I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates and dug, and I took the loincloth from the place where I had hidden it. And behold, the loincloth was spoiled. It was good for nothing. Then the word of the Lord came to me, thus says the Lord, even so will I spoil the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem, this evil people who refuse to hear my words, who stubbornly follow their own heart and have gone after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be like this loincloth, which is good for nothing. For as the loincloth clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory, but they would not listen. You shall speak to them this word, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, every jar shall be filled with wine, and they will say to you, do we not indeed know that every jar will be filled with wine? Then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, behold, I will fill with drunkenness all the inhabitants of this land, the kings who sit on David's throne, the priests, the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will dash them one against another, fathers and sons together, declares the Lord. I will not pity or spare or have compassion that I should not destroy them. Hear and give ear, be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness, before your feet stumble on the twilight mountains. And while you look for light, he turns it into gloom and makes it deep darkness. But if you will not listen, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. Say to the king and the queen mother, take a lowly seat, for your beautiful crown has come down from your head. The cities of the Negeb are shut up with none to open them. All Judah is taken into exile, wholly taken into exile. Lift up your eyes and see those who come from the north. Where is the flock that was given you, your beautiful flock? What will you say when they set as head over you, those whom you yourself have taught to be friends to you? Will not pangs take hold of you like those of a woman in labor? And if you say in your heart, why have these things come upon me? It is for the greatness of your iniquity that your skirts are lifted up and you suffer violence. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then also you can do no, you can do good who are accustomed to do evil. I will scatter you like chaff driven by the wind from the desert. This is your lot, the portion I have measured out to you, declares the Lord, because you have forgotten me and trusted in lies. I myself will lift up your skirts over your face and your shame will be seen. I have seen your abominations, your adulteries and nangs, your lewd whorings on the hills in the field. Woe to you, O Jerusalem. How long will it be before you are made clean? Let's pray and ask God for help. Lord, thanks for this chapter and thanks for this book. Help us to see what it means to live a life that's good for something or everything. And help us not to be foolish and ignore the warnings of chapter 13. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I still remember coming home with a report card from school uh, with the first and only E that I ever got, E being the absolute lowest mark you can get. It was for PE and specifically for rhythmic gymnastics. And I remember showing my dad, Dad, guess what? I got an E in rhythmic gymnastics, and genuinely he was so proud. I I never really got a report card that said that I was a good-for-nothing so-and-so. I'm sure that there have been times where teachers have wanted to write that, but teachers probably shouldn't write, your child is good-for-nothing. But good for nothing implies that something can no longer do what it was meant to do. It's no longer fit for purpose and it's no longer used for much else. It's like an ad for a closed business. What's the point? And in our passage today, God describes his chosen people as good for nothing. It's it's a withering assessment of Judah, the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem. And 
Today, what I want to do is show you why, um, so that they might function as a warning for us, so that we might not be a people who are good for nothing, and that God's word might actually show us what a good for something or even a good for everything kind of people and kind of life looks like. Because the truth is, uh, I don't think any of us want to live a life that's good for nothing. None of us would want God to say that we are good for nothing. And yet all of us, I reckon at times we struggle to feel purpose in life. We wonder what the point of it all is. Maybe we work a dull job. Maybe we continue in the same struggles year after year after year and things seem like they'll never change. Um, Maybe we just clean the house only for our kids to destroy it 10 minutes later and we just get frustrated with the reality that some things never change and our effort seems to never go anywhere. Some of us, we, we heavily invest in things. We make other things our life's purpose, whether it be our job, um, maybe our family, our, our kids, a relationship, whatever. And the challenge is when, when those things change, when the job changes or fails or the kids grow up and move out, we're left feeling lost. So here's the plan for today. I, I want us to, to consider why Judah had become good for nothing. And I want us to consider what a good for something life might actually look like. So let's let's jump into chapter 13. It's, it's actually made up of five sections. So we've got 1 to 11, this account of a linen loincloth or piece of material. 12 to 14, we've got jars of wine. 15 to 17, we have a picture of exile and darkness. 18 and 19, total exile, the impact on kings and from the highest to the lowest. And then lastly, we have this section 20 to the end where God's people are depicted, Jerusalem is depicted as an adulterous, unfaithful woman being shamed and exposed. So we're going to race through and make sense of them and then we're going to come back and consider why God says they're good for nothing. So we've got this account of the loincloth where God tells Jeremiah to go buy a loincloth. And you might think, okay, so God tells him to buy some undies. Um, I don't think so. I think likely this is a piece of material that goes outside of his clothing. It's linen, which is priestly garb. Now, Jeremiah likely wore a simple tunic with some kind of hairy material over the top to keep him warm. He was dressed like a prophet. And then he's put this linen cloth around his waist that probably goes down to his knees that's pure and spotless. He's dressed as a prophet, but he's got the outer adornment of a priest. It probably would have caused a bit of a stir. And God tells him to go and take this pure, clean piece of material and go hide it in a cleft of the rock on the Euphrates. Now, some of your Bibles might say perath. Um, In a whole bunch of other places in the Old Testament, perath is clearly an indication of the Euphrates River. And so the ESV translates it like that. Some scholars think that Parath is very similar to a place nearby Jeremiah. Instead of being, say, 350 miles away, it's like four miles away from Anathoth. And it's almost spelt like Parath, but not quite. And it's in the north. Now, it could be either. My hunch is the Euphrates is a far more clearer picture. But the point, either way, is clear. This piece of linen is pure and it heads to the north where invasion will come from and Babylon will come from. And particularly the north is the place where the people of Judah and Jerusalem had put their hope by making alliances with Babylon and their gods. And it comes back spoiled. Judah has looked to the north instead of to God. And as a result, like this piece of linen, they're now good for nothing. Why? Well, it says it quite clearly in verse 9. It says, I will spoil the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem, this evil people who refuse to hear my words, who stubbornly follow their own heart and have gone after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be like this loincloth, which is good for nothing. So God tells them why. They're good to nothing. And in verse 11, we're told they were actually made to cling to the waist of God. They were meant to be in close, intimate relationship to him. They they are actually meant to be a piece of adornment so that the nations would look at Israel and think, wow, your God is amazing. And instead, 
They're filthy. They're meant to be for his praise, but they're not. Now we get to chapter uh, verse 12, and what we have is um, a new section and a common proverb. Every jar shall be filled with wine. People of Jeremiah's day, they would have known that one. They reply, we know that. And then Jeremiah twists it and says, yeah, you're the jars, and God's going to fill you with drunkenness. This isn't a picture of partying and revelry. This is a picture of um, being in a state of stupor so that you can be easily attacked and destroyed. And so it's a picture of judgment. The people will be dashed together. Verse 15 to 17, we have an, another oracle of judgment. Um, is the, the people are told to humble themselves because God is going to bring darkness. In fact, it says, give glory to the Lord your God. That doesn't so much mean praise him. It actually means confess your sin before you die. We see the, the same phrase in the book of Joshua. There's a bloke named Achan who, who steals some of the things, the spoils of war that were meant to be destroyed, and he hoards them. And, and before he's killed, they say, give glory to God, confess. And he does and is killed. It's a similar situation here. And we see something of Jeremiah's heart for his people. Their coming judgment leads him not to pride but to tears. In verse 18 and 19, we have an oracle that says the king and the queen mother, that was a position of authority, the, the king's mother, are going to lose their crown. They're going to lose their throne. In fact, verse 19, the cities of the Negev, the Negev was to the south of Jerusalem, a very arid place. Very few people lived there. The point is this exile, which is repeated twice here, and the word exile is used for the first time in the book since chapter 1, is going to be so total that even the people from the arid parts of Palestine where no one ever went are going to be gone. They're going to be taken. No one will escape this exile. Now, I want you to notice these three oracles don't really say much about the why Israel have become good for nothing. We get a picture that they're proud, that they're not giving glory to God, that they're not listening. But in this final section from verse 20, we see it all sort of get tied together. The oracles of judgment so far have said that exile is certain. But here we get more reasons as to why. We're told that the invasion will be from the north in verse 20, that the flock that is God's people will be scattered and taken away. Verse 21 gives us a hint that Jerusalem trusted in Babylon. They made friendship with them, and instead of getting friendship, they're now going to be slaves of Babylon. And the people aren't going to have excuses. If they ask, why did this happen? We're told. It's because of the greatness of their iniquity. And in verse 22, we have quite a violent, awful image that your skirts are lifted up and you suffer violence. It's a picture of Jerusalem as a woman being defeated in war and exposed naked and abused. So an awful picture of judgment. In verse 23, we're told that they can't change. Can a leopard change his spots? In the same way you can't change Jerusalem. And so God is going to scatter them, send them away. Verse 25, when they came into the promised land, they were given a portion and a lot, and now their lot and portion is exile. Why? We're told again because they have forgotten God and trusted in lies. In fact, now God is the one who is going to shame and expose them for their shameful deeds. Verse 27 is a picture of uh, the worship of cult foreign gods, cult prostitutes in high places. They'll go and sleep with a cult prostitute in order to get a blessing of fertility from that particular God rather than praying and trusting in Yahweh. And the chapter starts with a clean piece of linen that's fouled. And the chapter ends with this question, how long will it be before you are made clean? So we step back for a moment and we think, why were God's people good for nothing? Well, the answer is pretty clear. It's because they refused to listen to Yahweh, to his words in the law, to his prophets that he sent. They knew best. They followed their hearts. They chased after other gods and they trusted in lies. They trusted in Babylon rather 
than in the God who established them and saved them. And they served those gods and ended up slaves of those gods. And all sorts of immorality followed that practice. They were supposed to cling to Yahweh and be for his praise and renown, but instead they've trashed his reputation. Their actions did the opposite. Now, at this point, if you're a Christian, it might be easy to puff up your chest and think, hmm, as I reflect on the world and culture around me, I can point my finger at the world and say, world, you are bad and God is going to get you. And I I guess there's some truth there in the sense that our world and culture doesn't listen to God. Following your heart and following the desires of your heart is a mantra of our day. To say otherwise is offensive and dangerous. Ours is a culture that makes idols. We idolise money and sex and materials. We idolise freedom and beauty. And yet I think the Christian's posture should be similar to Jeremiah, that of humble tears. But if we're honest, those of us who are Christians, we're not Judah But we are guilty, aren't we, of similar things? We refuse to listen to God. We make lame excuses. We're too busy to read our Bibles. It's too hard to read our Bibles. It's too hard to spend time in God's Word. Now, I've got to say, there are times where it is hard. You know, you're a mum of a newborn baby. It's hard. You're going through chronic illness chemo or serious and sustained mental illness where reading words on a page just turn to fuzz in your brain like that's hard that's really hard the truth is for many of us we just make lame excuses we've got time for our favorite tv shows we've got time to scroll endlessly through social media but we don't have time to listen to god and we say Things like, yeah, the Bible's really hard to understand. And and sometimes it is. Jeremiah is tricky to understand. But sometimes we say that. And then when we think about the new car or thing or whatever it is that we want to buy, we do hours and hours of deep research to learn all that we can. See, our hearts betray us. We don't we don't always listen to God faithfully. And the truth is we're also guilty of trusting in lies and following our hearts, even when our hearts are in complete conflict to God's word. We chase security and significance and satisfaction in places other than God, don't we? We think, if only I had, insert whatever you want there, then I'd be happy or safe or important. We all do it, I do it. We just think that if we had a little bit more money or a better job, or that spouse if we're single, or those kids if we want kids, or better kids if we have kids. If we only just had more sleep or better health, then we'd be safe. Then we'd be satisfied. Then we'd be important and significant. All of those things are good gifts. It's, it's okay and human and normal to desire those things, but they're not God's. They don't give the security and significance and satisfaction that only Jesus can really give. And to think so, if I just had that, then I'd be okay, is actually to trust in lies and become enslaved. And if Judah were called to cling to God, then how much more us? We're called to cling to Christ and live for his name and his praise and his glory. And the truth is often we don't. We live for our own glory. That's exposed every time we're selfish, every time we hold back when there's an opportunity to be generous, every time we expect everyone else to serve us and we refuse to serve others. All of which means if you're a Christian, don't let the first thing you do with Jeremiah 13 is point your finger at the culture around us, but rather let it cause you to repent, to repent of your blocked ears, and your wayward heart, and your habits and choices that slowly spoil you. But you know what? What's amazing in this passage is that there's hope hidden in it. 
especially this side of the cross, but even for the first readers of Jeremiah. You see, you keep reading through Jeremiah and you get to chapter 33. And chapter 33 answers the question, how long will it be before you are made clean? You see, in chapter 33, God promises to make his people new, to change their hearts, to do what they can't do themselves, to cause them, and it uses exactly the same phrase as chapter 13, to be for God a people, a name a glory. How? We're going to look at this more in a few weeks, but the ultimate answer is, you guessed it, it's it's found in Christ and him crucified. See, as we look through this, this chapter, chapter 13, there are glimpses of Christ all over it. He's like the pure linen that is spoiled by our sin and destroyed so that we might be made clean. He's filled with the wrath of God. He drinks the cup of God's wrath in full and he is dashed to pieces that we might be made whole and saved from our stupor and God's wrath. He's the light of the world engulfed in darkness. He's the king who loses his crown and and throne and it's replaced with thorns and a cross. He's the one who's stripped naked and shamed as an unclean, unfaithful, blasphemous man. And in doing so, he transforms his adulterous, unfaithful people into a beautiful, pure bride. Which means if you're not a Christian, know that apart from coming to Jesus, and asking him to transform your heart and your life to be forgiven of your rejection of God and your refusal to listen, your worship of other things instead of God. Apart from coming to Jesus, Jeremiah teaches us that only judgment awaits. But God, because he loves you, warns you. Our culture is one that's offended by judgment. But in the Bible, The declaration of coming judgment is always a gracious and merciful act of God. The challenge is we're often prone to believe lies about ourselves, And yet the Bible says that we're far more wicked than we realise, but God's love and grace and mercy is far greater than we could hope for or imagine. We can't make ourselves clean. We can't change our spots. But God can and does through Christ crucified. He dies on the cross for our sins. He offers forgiveness and life to all. Uh, Knowing and believing that and experiencing that has transformed and shaped my life and continues to transform and shape my life. In fact, the good news of Jesus only gets sweeter. And so if you don't yet know him, ask God for forgiveness. Put your trust in Jesus that he's the one that can actually change your heart and give your life meaning and purpose and hope. If you're a Christian and you feel stuck, struggling to change, if you feel convicted, then I want to encourage you to set your eyes and affections on Jesus, to actually take them off yourself a little bit and fix them on him. You see, the danger is that we only repent when we feel guilty, that guilt is the great motivator for for change. But the truth is guilt should move us to repentance, but grace is the thing that actually brings about real transformation in our lives. When we realise that Jesus loved us, knowing exactly what he was buying, with all our mess and all our struggles and our repeated failures, that begins to transform a person's life. So Jeremiah 13 tells us that a good-for-nothing life is one where we refuse to listen to God, where we worship other things, created things instead of God, and in doing so, we don't live for the purpose that God made us for, which is for his fame and praise and glory. And so I want to finish by considering what might a good for something or even a good for everything life actually look like. And in short, it's really just the inverse of what a good for nothing life is. I want to show you very briefly just two things. Here's the first one. I want to encourage you, if you want to live a good for something life, to trust God's word more than your heart. Hearts that love God can serve us well. Hearts that have been shaped year after year after year of by by God's word can serve us well. But sometimes 
hearts that are more formed by the world around us. And sometimes our feelings and desires run counter to truth. The truth is, you and I, we need to fill our hearts with God's word. We need to read it or listen to it. We need to form some habits and we need, we need to work hard at it. We need to stop hoping for a magical silver bullet where one day we'll suddenly just ingest somehow all of God's word and know it perfectly. Nothing in life works like that. It may mean that you just need to delete social media. It may mean that you need to cancel Netflix. It may mean that you need to get up 15 minutes earlier. Regardless, the call of God is for us to listen to him. And he speaks through his word. I, I just want to encourage you, you're not alone if you struggle in this. The truth is, every Christian I think I've ever met has struggled with being regular in God's word. There are only a rare few who have never had that struggle. I've had that struggle. Loads of us have. In fact, my hunch is that most of us struggle to regularly read God's word. Now, that shouldn't give us an excuse to not change or try, but it means that we're not alone. It means that we can actually share our struggles with each other and therefore encourage one another and spur one another on to listen to God's word. You see, I don't think we're going to get to the end of our days and think, gee, I read too much of God's word. I think we're going to get to the end of our days and regret all the silly ways we waste time. And I want to encourage you, as your heart longs for things that you know won't satisfy you, look back to Christ. Let feelings follow the truth of God's word. Remind yourself of truth even when it doesn't feel like it. And don't block your ears. Listen to God in his word. So a life that's good for something, it's it's going to be marked by trusting God's word over following our hearts and the sinful desires of our hearts. And the second thing is just to cling to God and be distinct. Now, God's people existed for his glory, to be a people for his name and praise and glory. That's what it says here in chapter 13, but they became worthless. I, I wonder, as you look at your life, have you got it clear in your mind and in your heart that you exist for God. Your life is not about you, it's about him. Your life is not about gaining praise and acclaim for yourself, but for him. Is it obvious that as people get to know you, that they start to discover that there's something distinctly Jesus-ish about you? See, it's really easy, I think, to feel purposeless especially if you have even unknowingly made your purpose in life getting rich or getting ahead at work or having the house or car or the kids or the spouse or the family or whatever. Because the truth is, if you make something created your purpose, if you get it, you'll then ask, ask the question, well, what now? Because that didn't really satisfy me like I thought. And if you don't get it, you'll despair. You'll rage at the world or at God because you didn't get what you wanted. But if your purpose is to live for God's glory, then every day and every interaction is loaded with purpose and opportunity and meaning. The menial things of life are opportunities to, to display the glory of Christ to the world around you. Every interaction is an opportunity to do that. And so cling to him. Be distinct. Find ultimate purpose and meaning in life in knowing that you exist for God's glory, to make much of him, so that the world will look at us as a people in a church and not think that we're amazing but think Jesus is. I think it's amazing that God can take ruined, good-for-nothing people and transform them. And so if you feel unforgivable, I just want to encourage you, don't trust your heart, trust Jesus. And if you feel like you can't change and nothing can ever change, I want to encourage you, don't trust your heart. Trust Jesus. If you feel like life is pointless and you're good for nothing, 
I would encourage you, don't trust, don't trust those feelings. Look to Jesus. See, God thinks you are so valuable that he gave his son to rescue you, to forgive you, to offer you new life and give you purpose and meaning like no other. And so press into God's word. Persist. Let's do it with one another. Join a small group so that you can actually encourage and be encouraged, so that you can share your burdens. Let God's word dwell in your heart and your mind richly. Let him change your heart and see that in him there is purpose. And in knowing Jesus, life is no longer good for nothing, but good for everything. Let me pray. Lord, please forgive the times where we refuse to listen to you and we follow our own hearts and serve other gods. Thank you that Jesus became spoiled and destroyed and shamed for us. Help us to cling to you and listen to your word and trust you that we might be a people, a name, a praise and a glory for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.